Christ as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong Christmas Baptist Church. The majority of you are at, at home. There's a handful of us here at the church, and uh, we're a church whether we're at home or in a building. And uh, just a thing to say, Gilbert is with us. He's up on his feet, which is really good to see. And uh, to see how spry he is, that's something else. Now for a few announcements. Now, in accordance with the Provincial Health Officer's orders of November 19th of this year, and effective immediately, there will be no in-person worship services at Aerosmith Baptist Church. We will continue to provide a pre-recorded service on YouTube, hosted by Sunday afternoon. I suspect today's might be a little later, uh, just to do with uh, when it can be dealt with. All person, in-person programming gathering in our facilities are suspended until further notice. With the exception of the scheduled memorial service next week, please note this event will be restricted to a total of 10 participants. We ask you to refrain, refrain or reduce in-person visits to the church office during this time. You may still drop off your tithe offering during office hours or donate online by e-transfer. The wearing of masks is now required upon entering the facility. Um, the leadership will meet very soon to discuss our new reality and make plans accordingly. 
We ask that you comply with the government directives and in the meantime, pray for each other and the church. Pray also for the protection of our health workers and continue to help, pardon me, uh, please continue to pray for our protection of our health workers and continue to help and care for the vulnerable in our fellowship and in our community. So as in all person gatherings are currently suspended, please watch next week for information on those that might be continue, continuing by Zoom, um, particularly like Bible studies. There is now an intention to go and forward with a toy drive for the House of Omid. This year we have not been involved with the Operation Christmas Child shoe box, boxes. However, we would like to help those who are ministering to folks in need. We will be holding a toy drive for the House of Omid, providing a selection of toys for them to distribute to the families along with the Christmas hampers. Currently, they provide 200 hampers a week for families. We are looking for toys for children from the ages of birth to teens. If you feel led to be involved in this effort, please bring your items to the church during office hours by December 6th. There will be a box in the foyer. Please see your weekly email for links to all the above information. And that's all that we have for announcements this day. Well, thank you, George. And again, welcome to our uh, recorded session of, uh, or church, I should say, service of, uh, for Aerosmith Baptist Church. And we're glad that you could join us. We'll start as we uh, regularly do with a word from Scripture. Uh, this week in Isaiah chapter 40. The prophet says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry, and I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We bless you that you are the everlasting God. You are reigning will reign, have reigned, and are currently on the throne, Lord. And we thank you for your word, Lord, that we can put our faith in, Lord. Your word will stand forever. Lord, we thank you that you know our frame. You know how we are made, Lord. We are, we are like grass. We are weak, Lord, but you are strong. And your Bible tells us so. And we thank you for that hope. So, Lord, we, we come to you and we just ask for your strength and your um, filling in our lives, Lord. We need, uh, we need you. So, Lord, we pray that you would um, minister to us this morning, minister through us this morning, Lord. And may your word uh, go forth. And, um, Lord, may you just be glorified uh, above it all, Lord, and help us to focus on you, tune out um, the distractions around us and in our hearts, 
Lord, that we may give you all the glory. And we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I know most of you are at home, and I uh, invite you to stand if you would like to as we continue in worship.
have the opportunity to go to our God in prayer. Uh, let's do that as a family of God. We are blessed with your presence this morning, whether we're at here or at home. Lord, we give thanks for the freedom that we are able to worship even in these times of a pandemic. Father, we bring you this morning our tithes and offerings to you, and we ask for your blessing on them in a manner that these monetary gifts would enable the local church work amongst your people and the missions we support. Father, we are living in times in our society that has experienced, has experienced things we've never known. We are a people who struggle with change. Lord, I pray that you would give us the heart to obey and to honor the requests from those who govern above us. Lord, I think of those who are in health care. We have a couple of members in our own church who are on the front line. Their lives have been disrupted by it. Lord, we pray for the protection of them and their families. Lord, we also think this morning of Tertia and her family. Lord, I understand that Hugo Line is going to step on a plane this week and come to Port Alberni. Lord, I pray for their protection as a family as they travel. Lord, I also ask that you wrap your arms around Tertia this day. Lord, I pray that the time they be together would be sweet. 
Lord, I also think of those who are in facilities here in town who are part of our church body. They too are isolated, Lord. I pray that you would give time for the caregivers to socialize with them, that the loneliness would be abated to some degree. Lord, I also think of Pastor Leland and Nancy. Lord, I thank you for the rest that they can have. Lord, but I also ask that you would reveal to them to know what their future is and to guide them through that. Lord, we also are, as leaders, faced with change. Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom as we meet together to plan for the church. Lord, I also pray for protection for our programming, that we would not drift, that we would stay close to you. Lord, I also ask for wisdom for new creative ways of worship as a body of believers, that we would try new avenues. Lord, but also above all, that we would continue to be witnesses in our community wherever we go. Lord, and when I think of the community, Lord, we have a good number of people who are not properly housed in this community, and we've become more and more aware of that these days. Lord, I pray for your blessing, particularly upon the Salvation Army and the Bread of Life as they minister to these people, meeting the basic need of food. Lord, I pray for wisdom for the community leaders to come to terms and to give guidance and to make plans to provide a correct housing. Lord, we also think of the House of Omid these days. Lord, they have greater needs than ever. Lord, we understand that they are providing a couple hundred hampers a week to families who are unable to get the gainful employment they were once used to. Lord, I pray that you would meet their needs. Lord, continue to be with us as a, a body. Lord, I pray for Andrew at this time. He's going to bring a message to us shortly. Use him as a vessel. Lord, and that we would come away with a greater understanding of your scripture. And Lord, give us a guidance in how to apply it in our daily lives. I ask this all in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask you to get your Bibles, and we'll be uh, reading from the book of Philippians. So from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. So I'll give you a moment to get your Bibles. Beginning at verse 1, chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Udaya and I plead with Sentech to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help those women who have contended at my side in the case of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. Those names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, or see in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So far the reading of God's word. working? Good. Let's open with a word of prayer. I, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. 
that you give us, Lord, as uh, your heart, your thoughts to us, your will. And Lord, may we take it as such, Lord. May it be your word and your thoughts that are being spoken this morning, Lord. And Lord, may they find good ground in our hearts and bear fruit, Lord. We just thank you for promises and hope and encouragement and instruction that your word provides us, Lord, as the solid rock and a sure foundation that we can build our lives on. We thank you for that. Thank you for this time. Help me to speak your word. Well, let no one say that God's plan and timing isn't perfect. He's arranged this passage of scripture for this time and place. In the midst of a global pandemic, as we in BC are starting our second lockdown, and as you are watching this at home, and this morning as I'm preaching to a mostly empty sanctuary, it's very appropriate today's passage talks about anxiety and God's way to overcome it especially during the current uncertain and challenging times of this pandemic. We are all dealing with anxiety for various reasons on some level or another, whether it's due to mental, emotional, physical, health-related, relational, social, or financial stresses, worries about school or workplace, place safety, or just the current state of the world and the future in general, we're all affected in some way. Back in May, Statistics Canada conducted a survey to gauge Canadians' anxiety levels related to the pandemic. Some of the highlights, they found 24% of participants claimed fair or poorer mental health, up from 8% two years ago. 52%, more than half, said their mental health was worse. 41% of those report, reported moderate or severe anxiety. 88% of participants said they felt at least one symptom of anxiety in the past two weeks. 43% of those financially affected reported symptoms of moderate to severe anxiety. And 64 percent of youth ages 15 to 24 claimed that their mental health was worse, with 41 percent being moderate or severe anxiety again. So this is generally where we are at as Canadians, and it's interesting to see as we start the second lockdown what, what the, our mental uh, health is like. But almost everybody is affected. They say anxiety is a feeling of apprehension and worry over impending or expected future threat. As Christians, though, God does not want us to live in worry and anxiety. He wants us to trust him. He has a better plan for our lives. And the Holy Spirit, through Paul in this passage, gives some commands, principles, and promises to help us. And as a you know, preparing for this, I, I feel humbled to preach this message just to do this topic justice at this time as we're all struggling in this. And second, to admit that I'm humbled because I struggle with anxiety. I have in my life, and I feel, what right do I have to um, say anything about it? But I need to hear it too. So let's dive in together. Verse 1, chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So we'll to go back a bit and set the stage. Paul starts with a therefore, and as always, what is it therefore? He's going back to the ending of the last chapter. 
where Paul has laid out his motivations and convictions in his own walk with Christ. He said he seeks to know Christ and his sufferings by any and by any means attain the resurrection. He says not that he has attained it, but he presses on, striving for the upward call of Christ, and that this is a mature attitude to take. Those who are mature in the faith, this should be our, our common attitude. He closes by reminding us that our ultimate hope is in heaven. It is our true home. We are all we are heavenly citizens, and we await Christ to come and give us new heavenly bodies. And to be with him, where there is no more tear, no more pain, no more disease, no more death. And then, so in that light, Paul exhorts them and us to stand firm in the assurance of our salvation in Christ. As believers by faith in Jesus and his work on the cross, we have a hope of a blessed life beyond this world. We can take it to the bank. We have a deposit in heaven, and the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. When we die, God honors Christ's deposit for us, and we gain our eternal heavenly reward. This is a hope that the world does not have, and that we can rejoice in, and are to tell others about the reason that we have hope. In this passage, Paul uses personal, emotional language. He says he loves and longs for these people, his beloved brothers and sisters. He really cares deeply for them and has really poured his life into them. And they love him too. They have supported him throughout his ministry. They are his joy. They bring him joy, not his ultimate source, but a source of joy for him in this life. As he watches them grow in their faith, he says they're his crown. And this is meaning the things that we pour our lives into for God's kingdom here on earth are part of our rewards in heaven. And so he has this great affection for these people, like a father echoing the heart of God the Father. And like any father wants to see his kids succeed, and especially wants them to get along, as we'll see in the next verse. Verse 2, I entreat Uyoidia and Sintuki to agree in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. So now he addresses uh, a matter in the church, a personal housekeeping issue between two of the women in the church. And we don't know anything about them. They had some sort of disagreement. And it seemed to be disrupting the church, maybe starting to get political, maybe, as these Things, th things tend to happen of people starting to take sides. Whatever the source, Paul wanted to nip it in the bud right away and not have it harm the church's unity. It's really the only sort of blemish in a leather, letter to an otherwise very healthy and strong church. He, again, he uses strong emotional language. The word entreat um, can be translated as beseech, implore, Plead, urge. This he is. This is a. Uh, uh, he's really pouring out again his heart. This is important to him. That they would put aside their differences, their unwillingness to compromise, which really is rooted in pride. Now, we're not always going to agree with everybody, and and really we don't have to. Be. But we are to agree in the Lord. As believers. What we share in common is greater than opinions and minor disagreements. We have unity through the Holy Spirit because we share a relationship with Christ. As Paul said earlier, we are to have the same mind as Jesus, one of humility and love. 
And he asks another brother in Christ to help these women through this situation, to help resolve their differences. Again, we don't know much about him. He's called the true companion. The Greek word suzugos means yoke fellow, co-laborer, colleague, fellow worker. And many biblical scholars believe that this is actually a proper given name, that his name, Suzugos, is who he is. He is a true yoke fellow in both name and deed. And so Paul then asks this brother, along with these two women and another brother, Clement, um, who were all fellow workers uh, with Christ, uh, with each other for the gospel of Christ. They shared this camaraderie together, like a band of, of brothers and sisters, like a military unit, you know, out there on the front lines, fighting for the gospel. It's the same word as in uh, chapter 1, verse 27 of Philippians, uh, meaning shared work. And when he talks about them striving together for the sake of the gospel. So he asked them also, come alongside and again, help these two women to come together in, in agreement. He says their names are in the book of life. A reminder of what is truly the more important thing. The inheritance they have in heaven through knowing and being known by our Lord. There's a passage in, in Luke where Jesus talks about this. He, after he sends the, the 72 disciples out, they return. He says, picking it up in chapter 10, verses 17, 21, it says, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy." and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So Jesus uh, had sent his disciples out in his name, in his authority to preach, heal, and do miracles empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they got back just totally on fire for the Lord and excited by the miracles they performed and just preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus, knowing their hearts, knowing the hearts of man, knowing that, you know, we all have pride, and knowing where it could lead, brings them back down. He says, he saw Satan, the highest and most beautiful angel, fall from heaven full of sinful pride. Yes, I've called you. I've given you authority to minister in my name, even over the spirits. But don't boast in that. It's exciting to be used by God, yes. But remember, it's his work. Instead, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus is saying, by my blood, by my work, rejoice in my completed work in you that you can access by grace through faith and by which you have an eternal blessed inheritance waiting in heaven. And I love how he finishes. He calls them little children because honestly, that's how we act sometimes, really. And it, it kind of seems like Paul may have had this passage in mind to help refocus their hearts on the main thing. It's an awesome privilege to serve God and a blessing. But we can sometimes pridefully take ownership over that ministry. Think that we're doing it all. And we can make our identity all about that, what we do for God. We are called to serve the Lord, yes, and do works in response to Christ's love and grace. But Paul and Jesus both say, don't rejoice in what you do. Rejoice in what Christ's already done. We are to fervently strive to obey and follow Christ here. And also to rejoice 
in our inheritance in heaven. And Paul expands on this concept of rejoicing. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. In case you didn't get it the first time, he says it again. And the theme of joy is one that runs through the whole book of Philippians. Amazing as Paul is writing this from prison. Yet he, this, this concept of joy just flows out of him. Paul tells us now to rejoice and again rejoice, making a point. This is important. What are we to rejoice in? Well, we're to rejoice in the Lord. He is the source and the object of our joy. Well, what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? How do we do it? First, it's a choice we must make daily, really, to rejoice no matter what. Seek and ask the Lord for his joy. It's not a superficial happiness that goes up and down based on circumstances, but a deep and abiding joy. It comes from knowing and reflecting on the character, work, and promises of God in his word choosing to focus on him, blessing him for who he is, hallowing his name, remembering all he's done for us, for the salvation and the hope we have waiting in heaven, trusting he loves us and has a good plan for our lives, and just blessing him and giving him all the glory. It's not about ignoring our lives or the problems in our lives, burying our heads in the sand or just all pie in the sky, all we're thinking about is, um, you know, heaven ignoring anything on earth. No. But it's having this foundation of joy, of his joy underneath it all to help us weather whatever storms of life come. Is it rejoicing sometimes? Is it rejoicing occasionally? No, it's rejoicing always, in the good times and in the bad times. We're to rejoice always. Normally we tend to magnify our problems and minimize the Lord. But when we magnify the Lord, our problems become minimal and tend to be, seem smaller. Well, let me tell you, this is not easy. This is one of those real rubber meets the road Christianity topics. When the storms of life crash in, when we're dealing with a loss, when we're dealing with a bad health diagnosis, when we're dealing with a broken relationship, a lost job, this can seem impossible to rejoice in the Lord, and yet we're called to. I've mentioned that I have wrestled with anxiety and depression for much of my life, and this, this concept of rejoicing in the Lord has been a struggle in my life. I could mentally assent, but the emotions were just so overwhelming that I had trouble really getting out of that and truly rejoicing in the Lord. And in preparing for this message the last couple of weeks, you know, I, I would really, you know, kind of put the Lord to the test, put a fleece out there, and, and really sought to rejoice in the Lord. You know, rather than dwelling on problems, always sought and tried to remember and praise the Lord in some way. Count your blessings, right? You say that, and it seems kind of trite at some Times, but it's it's true, and um, and it's it's just submitting ourselves under the authority of God and His Word, and saying, "I know I don't feel like rejoicing, but I am going to choose to rejoice in the Lord." And you know what? I really did notice a huge difference. That you know the that passage in Nehemiah says the the joy of the Lord. This is our strength. This is my strength. Verse 5. 
says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Verses 4 and 5 are kind of like linking verses that tie together the two parts of the passage, conflict and anxiety. And, and Paul then says what our attitude as believers should be in these situations, really always, but especially in these situations. He says we should be known for our reasonableness, or other translations say gentleness, or moderation, consideration, graciousness, forbearance, gentle spirit. And this is what we're to be known as, as believers. Some would see this as a weakness. Oh, you know, too ineffectual. No, it's more like meekness, which is a strength under control. Where again, we're choosing by the power of the Holy Spirit to show gentleness and forbearance and graciousness. Not just gentleness with those that we like or agree with either. It's to be shown to who? To everyone. Hard normally, especially difficult in trying times when we're going through um, a trial. And when we have conflict or anxiety in our lives, we can, what, become cranky, become harsh and selfish and lash out at others. Anybody? identify with that? No? This is not the way we are to be, even though I far too often am. The Lord is calling us to a better way, a life of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is a life and a heart of someone completely trusting in the Lord to fight their battles. This is a heart of someone giving their anxiety and stress to God and trusting their cause to him. It's a life of someone living for his kingdom, knowing the Lord's coming could be at any time. And we are to be about our master's work. So in summary, we're to rejoice in the Lord, whether we want to or not, really. It is for our good that the Lord tells us this. We're to rejoice in his work, in Jesus' work for us on the cross, dying for us and rising again to give us new life and eternal life and that we have a hope in heaven. This is what we can rejoice in, that we are no longer bound to sin. He gives us the power but by his Holy Spirit to overcome these things in our lives and these patterns. And it's really just entrusting our lives to the Lord and seeking to bear the fruit of joy and gentleness. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your re request be made, know be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul now gives the command to not be anxious. It's not optional. It's not you know, maybe don't. No, it's do not be. It's a command. It's not optional for the Christian. And man, as someone who, as a Christian who struggles with anxiety, this can stress me out. And I end up feeling guilty. You know, I'd have anxiety about anxiety. <laughs> maybe somebody identified. I'd feel like somehow I, I'm failing as a Christian if I have anxiety or depression. And you know, lately, again, the Lord's been working in my life and revealing, you know, no, it's not that I'm failing, but it's, it's an area that I need to grow in. It's an opportunity for me to grow in faith in that area. God is a holy God, and with all his commands, he sets the bar high. 
Like 1 Peter 1.16, be holy for I am holy. How, how is that going for everybody, right? Yeah, not to be flippant, but this is the reality, right? God doesn't lower the bar for us. He sets the bar high. God's commands are good. They show his character and his standards. But they're an invitation to the better life that he, he, a loving heavenly father, desires for us. They give us something to aim for and strive for, as Paul is talking about, strive for in the marathon that is the Christian life. And all throughout our journey, God's grace Grace is sufficient, and his love is what keeps us going. Fall, repent, try again. Fall, repent, try again. Fall, repent, try again. That's the Christian life. And slowly, maybe, we fall less in a particular area. We're quicker to repent. There's growth in that area, progress. The Lord is working in us, in that area. We're going through a great series with the youth group on the book of James by Pastor Matt Chandler. And one of his big phrases on the Christian life is, it's not about, it's about progress, not perfection. It's about progress, not perfection. We won't be perfect in this life. One day, Christ will perfect us. But as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, are we progressing closer and closer to Jesus? And this command is a special command. It has more packed into it. It has instructions, and it has a promised blessing. Does he say, do not be anxious about some things? You know, these things, yeah, you, 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 you can be anxious about these. You know, maybe a list, top ten things, I don't know. No, he says, be anxious about nothing. God cares about every aspect of our lives. He wants us to completely trust in him. And when we are anxious, it is showing that we are not completely trusting in him and that we need to be trusting in him more. Well, how do we not be anxious? gives the instructions. First, pray, pray, pray. Commit everything to God in prayer. We are to go to God with all of our needs and requests. He wants us to ask him. And praying with the right attitude, not just coming to God and like, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this. And like, okay, thank you. It's like having a conversation of like, hi, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, I need this and this and this and this. And like, oh, okay, by, it's like there's no relationship or anything there. It's, it's not. We, we are to pray with the right attitude, not to treat God like a vending machine or Santa Claus. We're to pray with thanksgiving for past answered prayer and blessings and for the future answered prayer that he is going to do. We have faith that he will answer our prayer and are thankful for the answer. There's various tools and aids and um, acronyms and things that uh, can help in our prayer life. One of these acronyms is the ACTS prayer model. Maybe, maybe some of you have heard of that. It stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. It's just a way to kind of get our minds and hearts in, in kind of the, a good attitude for prayer. And, um, you know, the, really the important thing is to bring our needs, requests, cares, anxieties, and struggles to God, to entrust them to his perfect care. Then, is, then comes the hard part, which is leaving them there <laughs> and not trying to take them back. And when we do this, God promises to bless us with his peace. And not just any peace, but a supernatural peace, which can only come from him. There's no logical explanation for it. It's not a worldly peace as the, as the world would think of it. 
it's it is, can only come from God. Has anybody maybe had that? You know, everything falling apart, and you're, you're just crying out to God. Ask the Lord for his help and peace, and boom, all of a sudden, everything going wrong, but in the midst of this, there's this peace that you have that you can't explain that comes from God. And it says it will not only defy our own understanding, but his peace will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When we're resting in the assurance of knowing our lives are in God's more than capable hands, it gives us this peace, which he says will shield us from the fiery arrows of doubt and worry from the devil. So in summary, God does not want us to live in anxiety. That is not his plan for us. But he wants us to trust in him for everything, giving all of our cares and requests and praise and thanks to him in prayer. And he says he will give us his supernatural peace that will be a shield for our hearts and minds. Verses 8-9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is any worthy, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. The last part of the antidote of God's antidote for anxiety is about what we put in our mind, what we are thinking about, what we watch. You know, it doesn't do much good to guard our minds when we're letting the enemy in the back door. I'm not doing a diatribe against modern media or anything like that, telling you what you can and can't watch. That's between you and the Lord. But Paul's asking the question, what are we filling our minds with? We are in a culture, in a society that is just saturated with media and noise and images all around us with film, TV, internet, print ads, social media, books, mag magazines, and much of it really is not edifying <laughs> to, uh, to our spirits. You know, it's really no wonder why there is so much anxiety and depression when we look at what we put in our minds. There's a computing term, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't put in good data, you won't get good results. And so these verses are really a, a good gauge for us to stop and consider, what are we filling our minds with? What are we putting in there? Are we filling our minds with things that are mostly true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy? If not, maybe we need to rethink our habits. Are we being transformed by the renewing of our minds? Or are we being conformed to the world? I know none of us like to be convicted about what we watch, read, and listen to. And each of us are in different places of conviction. But again, the question, are we progressing closer to Jesus in this? You know. In, our, in my own life, I know there are things that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I'd have no problem you know, watching and, and listening to. And now, you know, I can't, I can't watch and listen to. It's just there's, you know, like, oh, you know, my, my spirit just kind of recoils at that. I'm like, that's not good. And, and that's, you know, it's not that anybody told me, hey, don't watch that. It's that allowing the Holy Spirit to convict and guide and sanctify my life in those matters, in those things. But sometimes, you know, we need a list like this. We need God's Word to shine on our hearts, to reveal our thoughts and attitudes, so that God can do His spiritual surgery on us. And, you know, again, this list is, again... Is God in his love 
and care, knowing and wanting what's best for us. You know, it's not a condemnation, but it's an upward call in Christ Jesus. Hey, you know, as Paul follows Christ, saying, hey, follow me over here. This, this is a better way for you to go. This is the best plan for your life. Think on these things. Grow in these things. So, in conclusion, God doesn't want us to live in anxiety. He has an antidote. He has a better way. And that consists of you know, rejoicing in the Lord, first of all. Rejoicing Christ's work on the cross and our hope in heaven. Focus on that. We're to not live in anxiety, but to give everything to God in prayer. Trust him, and he'll give his shielding peace. Third, watch what we put in our minds. Is it edifying? Is it good? Is it going to... Uh, help us in our walk with Christ or bring us further away from Christ. We're to seek what is good and pure and edifying. And again, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a walk. It's a progress, not perfection. We're not going to be perfect in all of these things. But again, this is God's plan and his way to help us to overcome anxiety and conflict in our lives. And um, he wants us to grow in it and seek him in it. Pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. You're a good and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord. And you've given us your word, and you've given us these words at this time, Lord. And you know our hearts. You know we struggle. We struggle with pride. And you tell us to rejoice in you. Rejoice in, in your work for us, what you've already done. You know we struggle with anxiety. And Lord, you say, don't be anxious about anything. But to give everything to you prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. You will give us peace beyond all understanding. You'll guard our hearts and minds, Lord. That is your, that's your will. And Lord, you, you care what we put in our minds. You care what we're um, filling our minds with. And because it does have an impact on what comes out of us and what our thoughts and attitudes are. We are influenced by what we put in. So help us, Lord, to seek to put a good, godly, edifying thing in. Lord, these, you've given us these instructions, these commands, for our good, because you're a good, perfect Heavenly Father. And you are giving this upward call to us to follow after you. As you do your work, in our lives as we are working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And you are bringing us to closer and closer to you, Jesus. You are doing your perfecting work in our lives by your Holy Spirit. We thank you. God, we, we just cry out to you. We need you more, more, more in our lives. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to Put these things into practice and grow in them. Help us, Lord. We need you. We bless you. We thank you. And give, give these things. Give our hearts to you, Lord. May you take them and mold them.
So um, if you'd like to, I'd invite you to stand as we continue in worship and response. And we're doing a, a hymn that is familiar, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, uh, but it's got a slightly different arrangement to it, um, which we ran across, goodness, 20 years ago. And uh, we've just always loved this arrangement. So um, here we go. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to Yeah. 
not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. solid rock, that we can stand in you, trust in you, Lord. Um, no matter the storms of life, Lord, you are faithful, you are powerful to uh, calm the storms or to help us through, Lord, and you will do it because you are faithful. We praise you and thank you that we can trust and rely on you, rest in, in your grace in our lives, rest in your love, and we can uh, trust in your word, Lord, and uh, for it is true. And for everything that we go through in life, Lord, you are with us. We praise you. of peace and days of rest in times of loss and loneliness the rich or poor your word is true that all my ways are known to you no trial has come beyond Step by walk beyond your prayer. The path is dark outside my view. Still all my ways are known to you. And oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known. I do not fear the final night, for death will be the door to life. You take my hand and lead me through 
you, Lord, that you know all the days of our life, Lord, and that you walk with us, all of them. You are with us uh, even to the end of the age, as you promised, Lord, in your word. And uh, Lord, we thank you that you have uh, overcome the world, Lord, that, that we don't need to um, fear or be in anxiety or worry, Lord. Um, you want us to live in faith and trust in you. Lord, so we ask for your help and the Holy Spirit to do that, Lord, to, to just walk by faith and knowing that our um, our hope is in heaven, Lord, and sharing that hope, uh, being a light and a witness to the world around us, Lord, that uh, without you has no hope, and Lord, to live in such a way that people ask, why do you have hope? And we can tell them, our hope is in you. Our hope is in heaven, and uh, to share the good news of your gospel with them, Lord. So we just praise you for all you've done, Lord. We praise you for who you are, the good and gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, who um, never leaves us or forsakes us. Lord. We praise you and thank you for that. And uh, we just ask for your blessing and um, peace and grace and joy as we live for you this coming week. We give all this into your hands and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We give the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Go with God. Have a good week.